Suzanne, you haven't mentioned infant circumcision. You want to say something about that? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I never thought about it when I gave birth to a girl. Uh, it wasn't on my, my radar. Infant circumcision has been proven over and over again to have no benefit. And all the major pediatric organizations in the world, with the exception of the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, come out directly against uh, really what is infant male genital mutilation. And I'm not going to describe what it does to the boy. I just want to say that it is very traumatic. And it, um, it affects a boy's feeling about himself and his, and his sexuality into adulthood. And it's the first time, as Marilyn Milos, wonderful intactivist nurse, first said, it's the first time a boy associates pain with sexuality. It, it is the most sensitive part of his body. And ancient tradition circumcision was a tiny little nick in the foreskin. They never attempted to move, move the whole foreskin. That has a whole history of anti-Semitism, but and why the Jews came out for total circumcision. But it's time parents recognize that their children, their boys, cannot speak for themselves, and mothers are the ones ultimately to make that decision, and not say, "Well, it's my husband's decision because he's a man." No, your job is to protect that baby. Unfortunately, there's some recent research showing that nurses and doctors are pressuring parents into circumcision. They make money from it, right? Selling the foreskins. So uh, again, make, make up. Uh, yeah, it's still going on. So you have to be very aware of that and cautious and, you know, put your foot down, even though maybe you're feeling vulnerable at the time. Uh, to well, the easiest, the, the easiest way to do it is to get a uh, government to not reimburse and insurance not to reimburse for doctors doing circumcision. But I also believe that if doctors were not reimbursed with extra money for doing cesareans and, and people were paid for caring for a woman and not for the procedure, per procedure, we would see all these unnecessary procedures in birth change too. But I go beyond that. I want to see midwives and nurse practitioners who are um, maternity and obstetric nurse practitioners be paid the same as doctors and and they should be paid for their patient for the client and we should determine what does it take to care for someone from what point in pregnancy to how many months after birth and they're paid a lump sum for that no matter what their degree is in our local hospital they used to have doulas until that which is a birth coach for the mother until the anesthesiologist found out his income was going down because it lowers the, the uh, risk of epidurals and uh, cesareans, right? When you have a doula. So then they- Yeah, because kind of women, women, yeah, women find that uh, they don't want the pain medication. They don't need it if they have one-on-one uh, -on -one support. And, um, and one of the tragedies of the COVID uh, epidemic is that the hospitals have gotten freaked out about having anybody with a woman in labor, which is absolutely antithetical to what she needs, what the baby needs, what nature needs in terms of creating an environment for a normal birth. But it's just another example of birth doesn't belong in hospitals anyway. Except for a rare woman, birth belongs in the community and birth centers in homes. Um, and it's just show, for those of us who understand the ramifications, uh, we can say that uh, this epidemic has shown that birth does not belong in a hospital. That's right. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say these couple additional things. You're welcome. Thanks again. Ciao.